Well, hello everyone. My name's Jan Seal Roberts, and I'm here to talk about predatory publishers. What's new? Well, first of all, who am I? So, as I say, my name is Jan Seal Roberts, and I'm a publishing director at ADIS Springer Healthcare. Now, ADIS is part of Springer Nature. I think we're the second largest publishing house in the world. And under ADIS, we publish 35 journals, about half of which were set up quite a long time ago and exist as subscription-based uh, journals. And the other half are um, journals that were set up as open access journals, where the author pays uh, an article processing charge for publication. But all of our journals offer open access with the subscription-based journals. It's via open choice. And within ADIS, we believe that all scientifically sound data should be published. Um, but we carefully adhere to rigorous peer review protocols, and we aim to be as transparent as possible in all our publication practices. But in giving this presentation, I have to stress that these thoughts and ideas are my own. So if you disagree with anything I say, blame me. So I did this particular presentation about a year ago uh, when I talked about the perils and pitfalls of predatory publishing. Um, but a lot has changed in the past year, so it did seem appropriate to revisit it. So let's go back and, and consider uh, the best definition of, of predatory publishers. And I go back to the definition that was coined by Beale, Geoffrey Beale, and that is predatory publishers are those who unprofessionally exploit the author pays model of open access publishing for their own profit. Now, these are not to be compared with legitimate open access uh, publishers who charge in a transparent way uh, a stated article processing charge and arrange peer reviewing in a way that's open and transparent to all. No, predatory publishers really are the bad guys of publishing. So how, how common is predatory publishing? Well, in short, it's big business. Now, the latest stats I could find was, was from a study by Shannon Bork back in 2015. And at that time, they reckoned that the revenue from reputable open access publishers uh, was about $244 million. And at the same time, looking at the uh, revenue that they reckoned was earned by predatory publishers, they thought it was about 74 million, which according to my figures, works out about 30%. So they thought at that point that about 30% of all open access material was produced and, and made available by predatory publishers. And latest figures are that there are about 8,000 predatory journals operating uh, that together produce about 400,000 articles each year. Uh, and these open access journals that are, are started by um, predatory journals are very easy to start, to start up. So the threat continues to grow. But what's the big problem, you may ask? Well, the fact is that these companies are aiming to attract article processing charges and other revenues under false pretenses, um, either to be something, pretending to be something they're not, uh, perhaps by mimicry or, or implied association with a legitimate journal or, or body, or pretending to be better than they really are. And that's often by quite blatant misrepresentation, pretending that they have a high, imp high impact factor when they don't, um, or offering um, other uh, features that they can't live up to. So who are the victims of all this predatory publishing? Well, in the first instance, it's the unsuspecting authors who are duped. Um, thinking that they're uh, submitting to a reputable journal. And often they are beguiled by um, the initial invitation, which is often quite effusive. These, these predatory publishers will send out spams to a whole load of, of, of names on a database. But often it's under the auspices of a journal title that may sound familiar. So they think it sounds uh, sufficiently um, authentic, and they'll often be beguiled thinking, at last I'm being recognised by something I can add to the science. But when they do submit, they will, might, they will find that very little peer review is often offered. And so the paper will fail to benefit from the advice of others. So that means that any obvious flaws aren't picked up. And um, if the paper is published, they'll remain there for all to see. And in the worst cases, some unscrupulous companies will actually pocket the article processing charge that the author has, has uh, paid, and they won't publish the article at all. But others will publish, but the author may then face unexpected charges. Uh, and then if they subsequently realise they mistake, they may find themselves having to pay a retraction fee if they have the temerity to wish to withdraw their paper. 
But another problem is that once they are connected with a predatory publisher, the author will now be linked to a company that will likely target them again for any other future scams. And this may end up to their reputation being tarnished amongst colleagues and also tenure committees who may um, look at them in, in disfavour for their implied poor judgement. And often predatory published material offers no checks for plagiarism, so by publishing with these journals everyone is vulnerable. And once you've published with these companies, your citation may be there, but there's often no promise of ongoing digital pres preservation should the company fold. Uh, and what then? So in addition to authors, reviewers are often uh, misled where they are involved. So these reviewers may be recruited thinking, great, at last I'm being recognised. And uh, they can, in good faith, review a paper carefully, maybe recommending that it's to be rejected only to find that in the end the paper's been published anyway with no uh, 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 account for, the, for their comments. So they end up feeling frustrated and uh, um, ultimately it leads to a sense of wasted time and perhaps damaged reputation by association. And again, once you're on the, uh, the, the database of a predatory publisher, it's hard to get off. And of course, KOLs themselves are often misrepresented. They're often recruited by a wide-scale scamming with email, inviting them to join an editorial board of a journal that, again, sounds familiar. And that's, of course, it's flattering. But even if they don't agree or if they subsequently decline, they often find that their names have been included anyway. So their, their name will be up on a website and others may look and think, oh, this is a predatory journal, what's this person's name doing there? And actually, it's not unusual for KOLs to discover that their names are on these websites without any previous association. And also, when they do write to these companies to complain, they insist that their details are removed. Um, often it's very hard to get that removal without threat of and often recourse to legal action. These guys are tenacious. And from a personal point of view, we find that uh, ethical open access publishers like ourselves are often feeling that we're tarred by the same brush. So you're an open access publisher, you charge article processing charges. Does that make you a predatory publisher? And of course the answer is no, we are doing things in a totally open and transparent way. It's just that we're operating with the author pays model. Everything is subject to rigorous peer review and only the, the, the papers that are deemed acceptable are in. But perhaps most worrying is the increasing sense that the integrity of scientific scholarship is gradually being and perhaps increasingly undermined by the practices of predatory publishers. The lack of robust peer review means that much of the content may be poor science at best, contributing nothing to the literature. And some of the science, the pseudoscience, is totally untrustworthy. And that's before you think about the ethical issues surrounding the wasting time of these studies, the resources, the animals involved, uh, and the patients. And of course, the lack of digital preservation that these companies offer in the long term. You may have seen this particular article that was published in Nature last month. It was by David Moore et al. And it's entitled, Stop This Waste of People, Animals and Money. It's a really interesting article. I recommend that you have a look at it. This particular team spent 12 months characterising the content of 2,000 biomedical articles, which were taken from about 200 journals thought to be predatory. And this was according to Beale's list. I'll talk about him in a moment. And during this study, uh, they found that fewer than 10% of the studies that were claiming to be randomised controlled trials actually described how the patients were allocated. And fewer than 25% of all these articles actually noted whether the patients and outcome assessors were blinded to group assessment or not. So the point is that whether this reflected rubbish science <coughs> at the time or poor writing up, which might have been improved by rigorous peer review, these do seem to have been a very sorry bunch of articles. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, most of the authors of the articles included in this, uh, this sample didn't appear to have been seeking a journal of last resort when going for these crummy journals because only three of the people who responded said that they had previously submitted their published article elsewhere. So, how do we recognise a predatory publisher? Well, it can be very hard, but there are some clues. So, for example, as I mentioned before, the, the invitation to submit are often overly effusive, 
and quite often very broad. So, dear esteemed author, we've been following you for a long time. You're clearly marvellous at everything you do. Why don't you submit to us on this particular subject or, or any subject, really? We'd be very glad to hear from you. And often these companies have false fronts. Their editorial offices seem to be based somewhere credible. For example, West Coast US seems to be a, a popular place. Whereas in actuality, many of these companies are based in India or, or Asia, for example. And often these companies' names sound familiar. And, and the journal title that they represent may be something that sounds credible, but often not quite right, although often uh, titles are apps, uh, actually hijacked, so you can get uh, journals that are pretending to be another journal. And editorial board listings may be non-existent when you look on the website, or actually fake, complete with low-res headshots um, that look quite fuzzy, which isn't surprising because often they've been lifted from other websites. And there are often a few contact names or telephone numbers provided on the website. Or if you do drill down and you spend the time trying to look, you'll find that the same name occurs many times. And email addresses that are used by the staff are often non-professional, so Google and Hotmail um, emails uh, pervade. And although when you look at the websites, they can look quite credible, credible and some bits of text look actually quite professional, it's not surprising because they're often lifted um, from, from genuine websites. But if you do drill down, you'll find that other bits ha um, have poor gra grammar or often glaring typos. And false claims are often made, re PubMed indexing or journal impact factors, but actually you, these facts can be easily checked if, if you're not sure. But you'll see that the publishing costs are often uh, implausibly cheap and the timelines unimaginably fast. And with no policies regarding retraction or digital preservation uh, included on the website. So if you look carefully, it does become quite obvious, usually. But um, although predatory publishers themselves often deny unethical practices, there are many well-known examples of uh, stings that have revealed how keen these companies are to pocket an article processing charge, irrespective of content. So here's an amusing example that might make you smile, but my apologies for the language. Um, this particular one was actually not intended to be a sting. Uh, there was a computer scientist from Australia, his name was Peter Van Plew, and he was so hacked off with being hounded by a particular predatory publisher to submit something, anything, uh, that he finally forwarded this 10-page paper, which had actually previously been put together by David Mazier and Eddie Cola, and it consisted of the same seven words repeated time and time again, about 800 times, I think. And he thought by submitting this, the company would finally get the point. So imagine how he felt when the esteemed International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology actually accepted it and then requested a publication fee of $150. But sadly, in the end, this particular paper wasn't published, but only because Peter Van Plew refused to cough up the dough. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? So what are reputable publishers doing to address the whole issue of predatory publishing? Well, first of all, self-defence, because most major companies find themselves battling these companies on a case-by-case -case basis to protect their own reputations and the legitimate journals that they represent. But it's not at all easy. And also through education, as sub several publishers, including ourselves, are doing all that we can to make sure that potential authors and others are kept informed about the risks of predatory publishers. But many of those we speak to seem to fail to recognise the dangers until they encounter these companies firsthand. And then they really are shocked. And as you can imagine, with companies operating with fly-by-night practices, as soon as one disappears, another in appears in its place. And it may be a different company name, uh, it may look a different journal, but they're often manned by the same people with the same dodgy practices. And then there are a few companies that operate in a sort of greyish twilight zone, sailing close to the wind with various less than ethical publication practices, but somehow manage to stay just about on the right side of the law for most of the time. But no discussion about predatory publishers will be complete uh, without mention of the name Jeffrey Beale, who's an academic librarian based at the University of Colorado in Denver. And over the years, he's done more than just about anyone to highlight the threat of predatory publishing. 
And off his own bat, uh, Geoffrey Beale ran a prominent online forum called Scholarly Open Access. And he ran this from 2012 until January of 2017. And also an email blog addressing issues uh, regarding specific journals and publishers that he'd encountered at the time, um, both through his own work and via those who wrote to him to voice their own concerns uh, and negative experiences with pressure publishers. And over the five years that he did this, Beale developed two blacklists, naming both the companies and standalone journals that he considered to be dubious. And these lists are known to all as Beale's list, which essentially provided a one-stop shop of publishing badlies. And even at the start, Beale, Beale was quoted as saying that he thought that about 25% of all open access journals could be defined as being predatory. But it's true to say that Beale himself was no great fan um, of the author pays open access model and therefore he wasn't without his critics. And there was also quite a lot of criticism about the fact that his blacklists were not particularly transparent, but he frequently made it clear um, that this was really done to protect those who were um, writing to him as whistleblowers. And it didn't probably help that he was compiling a blacklist of baddies, which obviously nobody wanted to be on. So consequently, those um, who were included tended to be extremely vociferous in their own defence, irrespective of the, whether the blacklisting was, was uh, legitimate or not. So what happened to Geoffrey Beale? Well, his blog and online list was suddenly removed in January of 2017 without any prior warning or subsequent explanations being given at the time. But in an opinion piece that was uh, written by Geoffrey Beale in Biochemia Medica earlier this year, Beale actually wrote about some of the pressures that he'd been under and how during the five years that he had maintained his blog and forum, that the requests to remove journals and publishers from his blacklists kept increasing in number and became a lot more intense. And that some people actually ended up resorting to nasty tactics using wide scale and often aggressive strategies and most latterly uh, targeted the officials of his own university. So much so that eventually Beale felt that he just had to back off and, and give up. And this is the quote that in January, facing intense pressure from my employer, I shut down the blog and removed all its content from the, the, uh, uh, the blog platform. Quite shocking really, isn't it? So what do we do now? No Beale's list. Well, there are some other options. And uh, well, first of all, just to note that Beale's list continues, at, at least for now, um, because um, the final version of Beale's list, which was dated 15th of January 2017, is at the moment still available online via this particular URL. From what I can see, this online presence is being preserved by someone who prefers to, be, um, to remain anonymous, I think largely for the reasons that um, Beale was experiencing himself. But he calls himself a postdoctoral researcher in one of the European universities. And um, he says he plans to keep the list updated as much as possible, but probably won't have time to do such a thorough job as Beale. Um, but he does warn um, viewers to, to aware, be aware that the list applicability um, and usefulness is going to diminish over time because he recognises he won't be able to be as thorough and keep up to date as much as Beale did in his five years. But secondly, there's now something called Cabell's Blacklist. So Cabell International is actually a long-standing whitelist directory of journals, but they've now started publishing their own Cabell's Blacklist, which, just like Beale's list, comprises a list of predatory publishing baddies, although they say they aim to maintain a blacklist that's much more robust, consistent and careful than Beale's list. Ouch. But to this end, the Cabell blacklist is careful to ensure that the full criteria for inclusion on the blacklist is given. Uh, and there's an appeals policy clearly stated for those who feel that they've been wrongly accused or maligned. And um, it's interesting to note that the ratings given in the list are on the basis of journal level uh, rather than publishers. So there's much greater transparency, uh, as, as was the case for Beale's. Um, but it does mean that there's a huge amount of work to maintain. So I'm afraid that unlike Beale's list, um, Cabell's blacklist is a much more commercial product and it requires a paid subscription. But it does seem to be like a positive step forward um, for institutions who need a more robust resource. So it might be worth taking a look at this. Um, if you can, to see what you think. And of course, there's the um, DOAJ, that's the Directory of 
open access journals. And this is a very well-known um, independent online directory of quality open access peer-reviewed journals. So essentially, this is a white list of goodies. And at the moment, it uh, lists more than 10,000 open access journals that are felt to adhere to high standards and peer review. And um, all the funding of this directory is via donations, so it's totally free uh, to access and also free to be included if your journal qualifies. Um, just as an aside, while we're talking about whitelists and, and blacklists, it might worth be saying, it'd be worth saying that for many years there's been controversy about whether it's better to have a blacklist of baddies, or uh, which everyone avoids, of course, or a, a whitelist of acceptable publications. And Beale himself admitted that neither publishers, or in his case universities, like the idea of blacklists, because uh, publishers don't like to be on them, of course. And researchers tend to avoid journals and publishers included on the list, especially if their universities fail to recognise papers that were published in the blacklisted journals, which of course is part of the point. But on the other hand, a whitelist uh, isn't perfect either, because by inclusion it may be assumed that all the journals on such a whitelist are equally ethical, which of course they aren't. And also by being included on the whitelist, some less than ethical journals that choose to operate in the grey area may be allowed to go unch unchallenged and to continue behaving unethically in the absence of strong enough evidence to completely justify their removal. So I guess he pays your money and takes your choice. But however we recognise, please make no mistake that predatory publishers continue to pose a serious threat to authors and to researchers alike. And in one of his final quotes before disappearing into relative obscurity, Geoffrey Beale made it clear that although he's now taken down his post and taken himself back from the front line, he remains serious in his concerns regarding the impact of predatory publishers on science. Strong words. So, getting back to basics, how does an inexperienced author avoid being scammed by a predatory publisher? The um, Think, Check, Submit campaign is a cross-industry initiative that's quite useful. It has the aim of encouraging authors to consider journal selection much more carefully during the submission process. And it really does what it says on the tin. It recommends that an author first thinks carefully about whether they are planning to submit their paper to a trusted journal and whether that journal really is the right one for their work. And then once they've thought about it, they then suggest that they follow a checklist to see whether the chosen journal is to be trusted. So do you or your colleagues know the journal? Can you easily identify and contact the publishers? Is it clear about the type of peer review it uses? Are the articles indexed in services that you use? Is it clear what fees will be charged? And there's more. Do you recognise the editorial board? Is the publisher a member of a recognised uh, industry initiative? Um, all sorts of checklists to go through. And they then say if you can answer yes to most or all of the questions, then complete the checklist and submit your article, but only if you're happy that you can answer yes to most of the questions. But they say you need to be confident your chosen journal will have a suitable profile among your peers to enhance your reputation and your chance of gaining citations. And publishing the right journal will raise your professional pro profile and help you progress in your career. But the paper should be indexed or archived where it can be discoverable. And you should expect a professional publishing experience where your work is reviewed and edited. So actually seeing publishers as providing a service to up the, the, the quality and ultimately the value of the paper prior to publication, which is what all ethical open access publishers will do as a matter of course. So, with all this assistance available to authors, I guess we have to ask why would anyone still choose to submit to a predatory journal? Well, perhaps there are still some authors who are ignorant of their existence, or maybe they're just naive to the risks, thinking that a predatory journal is quite frankly worth a quick win and can't really be all that bad. Or perhaps some authors really are just wanting a cheap and easy option, thinking they'll take a quick citation and run with that, even though the citation might not be particularly reputable or even discoverable. And as a side, it's probably also worth mentioning at this point that the use of the term predator has been questioned in this context, because are all the companies and, and journals operating in this area really denying the need for robust science and research integrity for the sake of profit? Or are some of the individuals concerned simply inept? Well, I know, I know what I think, but it's always worth a thought. And rather than being victims, is it possible that some authors 
themselves are deliberately seeking low bar options in order to publish easily and quickly, and thereby to gain a citation before moving on. Well, let's go back to the article I mentioned earlier by David Mower. Um, remember, this was the study of 2,000 biomedical articles taken from about 200 predatory journals. And I mentioned how the study found that the majority of these articles were shoddy in their content. But it's also interesting to note that um, whereas the authors of this particular study had initially expected that the majority of submissions to these predatory journals would have come from low-income countries who were maybe uh, not knowing better or, or just not educated about the risks of predatory publishing, they actually found that, get this, more than 50% of the corresponding authors of these papers were from high or middle-income countries. And when it came to the corresponding authors, their analysis found that the number of US-based um, authors was second only to the number of authors based in India. And what's more, of the 17% um, that reported a funding source, the most frequently named funder was the NIH. And it may also interest you to know that 11 of the articles in this, in this uh, sample were from the University of Texas and that nine were from Harvard. And just to remind you, of those who responded, only three of the corresponding authors said that they previously submitted their article elsewhere. Okay, so this was not the journal of last resort here. It really makes you think, doesn't it? So at the end of their paper, and I really would encourage you to have a look at this, um, David Murr at all makes some very clear recommendations um, how they think that predatory journals should be um, avoided from being um, allowed to continue to erode the integrity of, um, uh, of scholarly, scientific scholarship. And uh, they make it clear that they feel that researchers, research uh, publishers and funders should issue clear warnings against illegitimate publishers and make clear recommendations, which I guess is what I'm doing today. And that funders and research institutions should prohibit the use of funds to support publications in predatory journal um, publications and ensure that researchers are trained in selecting appropriate journals. But also, in, when they're seeking promotion or funding, that researchers should include a declaration that their CV is free of predatory publications. And they also recommend that ethics committees should ensure that researchers are working with institutional resources to ensure that they don't submit to any journals without reviewing evidence-based criteria for avoiding these titles. Because they say, if not, predatory journals will continue to erode the integrity of scientific scholarship. And actually to say that for those who are unwilling victims, that's bad enough. But for those who are actually choosing um, these journals, perhaps to bury um, science that probably shouldn't have been done in the first place and therefore wasting materials, uh, animals and, and, and money as well as the patients concerned, it, it really does make you realise that uh, it's, it's a huger issue than perhaps people realise. So that's what I had to say about predatory publishing. But finally, just uh, uh, finally, as before I close, I wanted to mention the issue of predatory conferences uh, because these two are becoming increasingly common and um, a lot of them are linked uh, to companies known for their predatory publishing practices. So in case you haven't heard of these yet, these are conferences that seem scholarly, at least at first glance, but are actually designed to exploit and make money. So in the first instance, uh, academics are courted and asked to attend and present uh, at a meeting that looks as though it could be quite kosher and add something to their, uh, to their CV. But subsequently they find that they're expected to pay and then a little bit later they find that actually as presenters they're expected to pay more than the people who are just coming to attend. So these conferences often have a very similar name to an ex existing meeting. Perhaps they're only differing by the insertion of a colon or even a dash they, they really are trying to masquerade as something that they're not. And um, these meetings are often set up to combine a, a series of broad topics across a range of disciplines. So they're applicable to a wide range of individuals who are invited, and, and especially more junior ones, with the implication that they're being invited to bring a fresh approach to a particular cross-disciplinary area. And a lot of these meetings seem to be organised in Asian countries um, that seem pretty exotic and enticing. And although some of these meetings are totally bogus, others do exist, but are found to be just third rate in terms of quality at best, and, and generally speaking, a total waste of time and money. So for example, when an attendee gets there, he may find that the, the headline speaker that was used to promote the meeting actually doesn't turn up. And when registrants arrive at hotels that have been booked and paid for, it's found that there's no record of any booking, nor of course of any payment being received. 
And once someone has booked and is financially committed to such an event, there seems no possibility of being able to uh, arrange cancellation or to obtain a refund. So if you haven't yet heard of, of predatory conferences, uh, please do make sure that you take note of these and spread the word. So I do hope that I haven't depressed everyone with my thoughts here today, but as always, the real key here is to stay alert and to keep informed. And when choosing a journal, always to bear in mind the reputation of the company behind it. And of course, the old saying that what seems too good to be true probably is. But here are some take home messages that I hope will be useful. So make sure your staff and clients continue to be informed about the existence of predatory publishers and how rampant they are in, in the open access journal arena. Uh, be aware of the dangers of lost data and damaged reputation as well as the risk of being associated with dodgy bedfellows who may be choosing these, science, these journals for non-ethical reasons, often just to get a citation from dreadful science that probably shouldn't have been done in the first place. And it's true to say that predatory journals are getting harder to spot, but if the website looks dodgy, it truly probably is. And when you look at one of these websites, don't be beguiled by seeing editorial board names that you recognise. Blurred headshots presented in an inconsistent style are likely indicators that these names may have been hijacked. And if you aren't sure, just go straight to the DOAJ and make sure that your clients, especially the less experienced ones, are aware of the Think, Check, Submit checklist. And finally, warn your clients to look out for predatory conference, conferences. Um, they are on the increase and they are likely to be at best disappointing and um, may even turn out to be complete scams. So thank you very much. <laughs>